Hello, and welcome to another Closure Study Group. Thank you very much for joining. Ooh, we've got six people uh, uh, on the line. Thank you very much. Um, it must be uh, must be warmer weather, bringing everybody else out today. Um, so this uh, this episode is really the first of several um, focused around building uh, and consuming uh, APIs with inside uh, Clojure. So one of the things I wanted to do was build a nice uh, kind of landing page for this virtual study group. Um, so you, YouTube is great for publishing videos, uh, finding videos. It, it likes to give you lots of random kind of choices. So I'd like to kind of have like a searchable, a nice searchable kind of uh, website that pulls off information about videos um, from this study group and uh, makes them a lot easier to find and put some more metadata around them and things like that as well. So one of the ways to do that is to use the Google's uh, sort of, uh, Google's YouTube API. So we're going to like walk through building uh, building APIs. We're going to use a few different examples as well. And uh, you could have uh, an API for a, a game that you've developed, and you could uh, use the uh, you have an API for the scoreboard. So you basically get information about the the scoreboard from the API. You could update the scoreboard as well using the API. Uh, but it, and it's not tied to your game, so it can be can be massively scalable to hundreds of thousands of people that are playing your game, and so on. So there's lots of different. Um, approaches to an API. Um, let's share my screen. There we go. Oh, I'm already sharing my screen. Looks like it is. There we go, share. Uh, I don't think I'm sharing my screen. Let's see, what's it doing? Uh, Share my screen. There we go. Oh, is my entire screen. Oh, there we go. So to everybody, there we go. The lovely sweet uh, pattern. Okay, so if we look at just very quickly, look at the uh, what is an API according to Wikipedia. So it's application programming interface. Um, this is just a very general term, really. So it's basically just the way that we can talk to other systems or talk to other pieces of code that could be libraries that we've written, could be libraries that um, other people have written as well. So there is, uh, for example, with the Google uh, YouTube API, there is um, uh, a, a library you can use. It's called this uh, Software Development Kit. They can use so you can download that for Java and Clojure, uh, so Java and Python and and JavaScript and a few other languages. There isn't a specific uh, Clojure one, but we could wrap that. Uh, we could wrap the Java one around there in, um, in Clojure, or um, or we can use remote APIs and specifically web APIs. And these are more uh, specifically around uh, you know like RESTful API calls where you're getting. Uh, this uh, you get returning JSON format, which is this JavaScript object notation. And so you can do basically put in a simple uh, URL uh, and you'll get JSON back in return. If we have a look at the Google API here, so usually APIs will give you uh, some kind of explorer, some kind of tool to be able to use here. So here we're putting in, we want to search for um, like video IDs. We're searching for live broadcasts. Uh, so this is going to be my live broadcast. We're going to get some content details. We're going to get status and so on. Uh, and I'm just going to look for specifically broadcasts that are upcoming uh, of all different types as well. So we, we're kind of filtering out some of the, we're not going to get the uh, broadcasts that have already been done. We're only going to look at the, we're only asking for ones that have been uh, scheduled in the future. And then when we execute it, we get, um, well, it, it's showing us what the request is. So this is a request we would put into, uh, we could put into our browser, but we could also use from our code as well. So we create this kind of request and usually a request needs um, a key. So we need to kind of set that up as well. And then we get this lovely JSON stuff back here as well. Uh, in Clojure, what we would do is it would just convert this into a Clojure map. And make it more uh, interesting uh, and more flexible to use. 
uh, and we may just uh, yeah just like, display the results somehow, or we might do some processing with this, and uh, we can also pass this on to another system, and so on and so on. Uh, but this gives us an idea about what we can get from uh, an API, and this is using this idea of uh, REST or representational representational state transfer. Um, but it's basically just allows you to do simple uh, gets and posts. Um, it's, it's pretty stateless, so it's, it's nice and simple, so it does fit into the closure world. Uh, and you can do things like gets and puts to uh, to get information and put information. So you can get, you can just get information you read from a system, which might come from a database or might be automatically generated. Uh, and you can also put information there, so you can write write information. You can save the, if you've got a high score on your game, you can save uh, that that high score in, in the uh, in the database that uh, that REST service is in front of. Uh, oh, good morning. Uh, uh, and what else have we got? Yeah, so we've got the Google API. So we um, we did have a go at this at the recent closure dojo we did we actually used uh, instead of using the rest we actually used the java uh, apis uh it did take a little bit of time to wrap them but we we managed to do that so i'll share that code uh in the in the, over the next week to show you how we did that um and often with apis you'll get um we, it's quite common to use this swagger interface now uh there's an open source version of swagger where it's basically is a is a kind of a document it's like a web page document that uh, describes your api describes the api that somebody's created uh, but it also lets you uh, be interactive with it as well so you can put in your own data here this is like uh, getting a component this is a simple api which just allows you to again, get names and information about pizzas and so on and where, where they come from uh, there's a link to, I'll put a link to this into um, the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, so you can build uh, a, you can build your own uh, API in Clojure and that will, we'll do that in the next episode. I uh, will show you how to do that as well. Uh, you can also get really fancy with APIs as well. There's something called GraphQL, which again, I think will come on, on to either the third or fourth episode. In this series, we'll talk about GraphQL, which basically gives you a query language on top of your API. So instead of just being um, a very simple REST call, you can have a, a more involved query. It's a bit more like uh, you're doing a database query with uh, SQL, but it's still very lightweight and still going over um, a REST API, as it were. And this is quite good if you've got lots of different data sources and you want to combine and get a single view of all your data as well. So those are kind of different things that people are doing inside. Um, uh, it's like the, the world of creating their own APIs. Uh, and there was a really interesting video, which I think I just linked in the comments uh, earlier. Um, this is a, a nice video from ThoughtWorks from Chris Birch uh, talking about how they use an API, I've just knocked up a very lightweight uh, API uh, that allowed teams to actually start talking to each other and communicating about it, uh, what they actually needed to deliver to each other. And it really did help them like drive communication between the different teams as well. And uh, and so, yeah, so most people when they're building something now will build an API because it's just the, the, the easiest way for people to use their services, people to use their software as well. I'm going to close these down a little bit, save a bit of memory. Boom, boom, boom. I'll leave that on. Uh, I don't leave that on anymore. Is there any questions so far? No, not yet. So uh, I did I, I did this practically closure web apps um, uh, website tutorial a while ago. I've just been starting to update it as well. So if we're going to build a an application. Uh, uh, program interface, we're going to build an API, then these are typically built on the server side, you might want to do a lot of processing uh, to uh, behind the scenes, you might um, have like a database that you don't want to expose. Uh, and uh, you, you've got a lot more scalability on the server side, because you're uh, 
and a lot more control. Um, because if, you, if you're writing something on the client side, then it's just running in their browser. Uh, and so there's there's more uh, interesting things to look out for when you're doing that. With server side, you can control the environment a lot easier. So we're going to look at creating a, uh, a web application just on the server side. And we'll give it a little um, uh, user interface so that you can actually see that it's doing something. It's it's often a bit hard to understand what's going on in the back end. So we will uh, kind of delve into some uh, the, a little bit of the theory as well so you can understand it. And this gives you a nice foundation of, uh, of what you're doing when you're actually building um, your own API in... Uh, uh, in the next episode. Okay, so uh, so this is practically GitHub.io, and this is a Clojure web apps uh, book. I'm going to start with uh, create a project. So I think that is linked in the. Um, did I put that in there? I thought I put the link in there. Um, I didn't put the link in there. Let me put the link in the in the chat window. YouTube. It's a bit be funny because I end up watching uh, myself. We so oh, there I am. I'm live now. We let's uh, let's mute myself otherwise I'll get very crazy. Uh, there we go. And let's just put this. So this is what we're uh, going to work through. We might not go through everything step by step, but you can have a look at all the details there as well. So what are we doing? Uh, well, this is creating a to-do list, um, a simple to-do list. Uh, you could call it anything you wanted to. Um, some of the other projects I've been working on is creating a like a, a application status monitor. So we can have a little, little look at that as well. Well, let's start with uh, following this and see how far we get. So I'm going to go to my terminal window, and I'm in a folder where I want to create a project. So I'm just going to create a line. Line. Uh, make that bigger so it goes on the other page. Uh, yeah, line. New. Uh, I'm going to use a template called app. Because um, it's going to add something simple for me that I want. I'm going to call it to do uh, list. list. Uh, so we'll show you what the app does. But so this is uh, line is the uh, lining and application for creating new projects and also building and managing closure applications. New is going to create a new application for me. It's going to use the app uh, template and the project name is to-do list. So you could call to-do list anything else you wanted uh, as well. And this is just going to create a simple project for us. And if we do tree, uh, oops, that's now a bit too big. And so it's created this kind of project file for us. So we create a folder called to-do list. And it is, uh, it's got documentation in there. It's got a configuration file for the project. And we've got source and test um, branches as well. So here we'd write our, our, our code. And here we'd write our code that tests our code. And let's have a look at that in our editor. So I'm just going to use Emacs. You don't have to use uh, Space Max or Emacs, but uh, uh, you can use Atom and uh, Visual Studio Code and, and IntelliJ and other editors as well. So let's open that up. So it's in projects. Uh, group. There it is. Let's have a look at the project file. A bit bigger. So um, this has added. Um, this has given us a basic configuration file for our project. Uh, we've got some descriptions here, and we can change that. Um, and we can give it a URL. We will we'll leave that for now. We can we can change the license. Um, I prefer using a different kind of license. Uh, oops. 
Boom, boom, boom. Um, I'm going to change how the project works. It's just uh, my preferred um, license I use. And uh, the most interesting part, I guess, is this: the, these dependencies. So uh, we'll come to those in a moment. So dependencies, so here are projects. We haven't actually installed Clojure. Um, I mean, you can use Clojure on the command line now, but uh, usually Clojure is just uh, one of the, the libraries that you use in the project. Uh, here we've got Clojure 1.9. Uh, we do actually have Clojure 10 is now available. It's fairly new, but it's, fairly, it's, it's stable to use as well. So we're going to use Clojure 10 for now. And um, it's added uh, this main uh, uh, keyword here. And this is just saying uh, when we run our application, this is the main namespace, and this is the file with inside the namespace we want to go. So this to do is the folder that we're in. If you remember tree, uh, we go back to the tree thing here. So we're inside the uh, this to do list, uh, and uh, in core as the file. So this is where you should look for the main uh, entry point into our application. Um, and then inside this file core, we're actually a core, which will be core.clj, then we're actually going to have a, a main function that we would call as a, as a way to start our application. Uh, and target is just for when we're building. Um, so when we build a, a jar or an Uber jar, it's, that's, that's the package that we build to be able to deploy our application. If we wanted to push it into uh, some server somewhere, we, then we would, this is where the application would build into. And these profiles are just uh, yeah, how to build that package. We call it an Uber jar. Um, so if you're familiar with Java, most uh, Java code is, is compiled uh, and then assembled into a jar file, which is a Java archive, which is a bit like a zip file. Um, and an Uber jar is, is the same. It's compiled all the closure uh, into a jar file, except it also includes uh, closure itself. So this closure library is also included in the Uber jar. So you don't actually need to install closure on the server. You can just run it. As long as you've got uh, a JVM, you can just run a closure application in that way as well. Hello, hello, hello. Lots of people joining. Cool. Uh, any questions so far? Let's see. I don't think there's anything else to explain on that. So the only thing we're really going to make changes to uh, is the dependency. So we're going to add some other libraries to help us create our server-side application. Uh, I'm going to share that there. And, and the only other file we're actually going to really work with today, because I'm going to be naughty and not write any tests today, um, is the source file. So if we go into the source directory, to do, do list, um, and I go into core CLJ. And you can see that there is already uh, a, a main function in there as well. Um, so, so, so this is the thing. If we run this application on the command line, then it will be this function that will be called first because this is in the to-do list uh, dot core namespace. And by convention, we use main or dash main. Uh, that's what... Uh, what we would be actually looking for um, to run the application. As you can see, it doesn't actually do an awful lot. It just prints hello world, so not, uh, not the most exciting one. So we will change this uh, to do some interesting stuff. Um, there is this gen class here that just allows us to can run. It just basically creates a shell of a, a Java class so we can actually run the application uh, there as well. Uh, and we'll add some more, and we'll add some libraries in here that we want to use to make this application work uh, and start serving up uh, things via our server-side web app. Let's go back to the browser. Let's go back to our... Um, so this is pretty much what I've followed here. Um, 
Uh, so let's go to the next page. Oops. And uh, let's just talk about updating the project details. Um, and uh, I'm going to put uh, an updated version of the all this code in here as well. Um, so let's just have a very quick look at how uh, how the web actually works in terms of uh, a web application. So let's just make that a little bit bigger. So you've got your browser, which I'm using right here, and um, so when I when I go and enter a new uh, address, then it's going to go to a server and uh, and try and do something, try and give me some kind of response. Uh, so so this uh, this URL is turned into some kind of request. So we need to send it to a server, uh, and we're going to use uh, a library called Ring that's going to help us make this a lot simpler. Uh, so this is we're going to send this message to um, our little server we're going to run. So we're going to use something called Jetty, which is a little Java application server. Uh, and this is going to be running our little application. And this is going to basically turn our, our URL into a, a request. And that's going to be in the shape of a map. So and this is just going to be a, a normal kind of closure map. So it's going to have key value pairs. And that will allow us to do something. Uh, it could be an anonymous function. We could have just a simple function that returns hello world uh, to every request, no matter what request we are. But we can also have different requests and have different functions uh, based on the type of request that we're actually getting. Um, and so we'll need to add uh, the ring library as a, as a dependency and include ring uh, in the namespace. Uh, and then we'll add uh, the Jetty server, and then uh, we'll be able, we should be able to run the web application. So let's see. I did I update this? Oh, I haven't updated. I haven't pushed my change yet. Uh, so, so some of the uh, some of these are a little out of date. So I'm just going to push that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't push the change. So Ring 1.4 is a little bit out of date. We can always go to jars.org, uh, which will give us uh, a list of the libraries we can use. So if we go and look for, um, go and look for ring, oops, if I could type, then we can see that ring is is now 1.7.1. And if we go and have a look at uh, ring, let's just use the whole of ring now. So ring can kind of come into separate pieces. You can have specific, you can just have the ring core, uh, but I'm just going to grab everything you know, for this uh, example. And it, it gives you the uh, the dependency and how to use it both for lining and boots, or if you're using other uh, build tools as well, there's descriptions there. So let's grab ring 1.7.1. And I'm going to go back to uh, space tab, go back to our, our project.clj file. And so we've got closure there as a dependency. And let's put in ring as a dependency as well. And um, the ring will is kind of a low, lowish level uh, library that will allow us to kind of manage the the whole kind of HTTP, TCP, IP kind of protocols uh, and basically turn all the kind of the, the complex kind of uh, low level stuff of a web request into a nice uh, into a nice map that we can work with. Uh, and then there's something called uh, Composure that we can use to be able to do to make decisions about what to do with these requests. So we'll add Composure in a moment as well. Um, so let's add ring. So we're just adding that as a dependency. I haven't actually started my REPL yet because uh, I would need to restart if I uh, keep adding versions of ring. Uh, let's see. Adding, uh, sorry, if I keep adding different um, uh, dependencies. Uh, so this is just adding, we've already got a main. So this is, I've used the, uh, because I use the, uh, 
the line new app template. Uh, it's already added a main. Um, it's already added a, a, a like a main keyword and value for us in the project configuration file. Um, and uh, there's some information about namespaces and how to use them as well. So we're going to we're going to include um, the the ring namespace, so we can actually use the functions that are contained within inside that library. And so we can. Uh, oh, I really didn't update this one, did I? Uh, uh, let me just. I think that might. So let's just jump to the source code. There. So we've got our namespace. Uh, so it's, it, this is just going to contain the functions in there. So I can I could call uh, main from here uh, because it's defined in the namespace, and I would need to give some arguments possibly. Uh, oh, it's optional, um, but yeah. So I can give arguments if I want to, uh, and then I could call that. That would call main, but I can't call if I wanted to call something from. Uh, a different library, and uh, say there is a, a closure dot string, which is is part of closure, but it, it's not part of this namespace. So uh, if I wanted to call that, I'd have to give it the full uh, name, uh, including the namespace, to, in order to be able to call this function. Um, and so that that would work, but that if we had to do this for all of the functions, then that would make our code quite verbose uh, and possibly harder to read. Um, so one way we can do that instead of uh, instead of doing, using the full name each time, we can require uh, the, that namespace, the the library. Uh, in our in our current namespace, we can just require it into there, and um, uh, and then we could just use uh, it much more simply. So let's take the existing examples. Let's take closure string. Um, oops, so we want to require closure dot string, and uh, we can give it uh, an alias. Uh, so as string, and now instead of having to put uh, closure dot string, because this could this namespace could be quite long in there as well, especially if people have been putting meaningful words in there. We can just do uh, string uh, dot uppercase, and this is quite good. Compromise it keeps it kind of shorter, uh, but we can very easily see where this function has come from. We know this function is from. An external library, an external namespace, uh, and so we uh, we we know to kind of go looking for uh, this uh, somewhere else. This is kind of the usual way we do that. You might see the the use uh, uh, function, but that's quite an old style uh, thing there as well. And you might also see um, instead of as, you might see. Uh, re refer, um, and you can refer specific um, functions in there, and the, this means they're like uh, as if they were actually written in the namespace. Uh, so we can actually now use if we're going to use the the string almost everywhere in this in this. Um, namespace, then we, uh, oh, sorry, that's not right, is it? That's not string. Uh, we're going to use the function uppercase everywhere in this namespace, then we could refer specifically using that name. And, um, and then we could just use it without having to, um, without having to specify it an alias. So the way we've required it in here is uh, it makes it um, very specific to uh, very specific to the um, uh, this is if we've written uppercase function in the um, in the namespace itself, even though it's uh, a, a namespace that's defined. Uh, sorry, even though it's a function defined in a different namespace. Uh, 
Oops. Oh, yeah. And I forgot to put the square brackets around it. There we go. So we put the name in square brackets. Uh, boom. In the... So let's keep that there for now, just an example. And we can also require multiple uh, libraries. It doesn't just have to be one. Uh, yeah, we'll see how uh, how we actually pull in these libraries in a moment. Uh, and uh, I'll do that. So uh, let me just add all the libraries we need first. So if we're going to require, um, so we require multiple ones, multiple libraries. So for ring, uh, we need to require ring. And I've forgotten, is it ring? I think it's just ring. Just check. Uh, so we're going to require uh, ring. Oh, yes, we want the ring adapter jetty. So we want to be able to run. So this is actually going to run a... Um, uh, an application embedded version of the Jetty application as well. So it's going to run a little web server uh, inside our project for us. And we just need to pull in the, the right library. And we're going to give it, uh, we're going to use the alias approach. So we're going to uh, bring in ring adapter Jetty. So that's the namespace. And rather than using ring adapter Jetty in front of everything, we can just use Jetty. And so then instead of uh, uh, just a dun -dun 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 -dun. There we go. Um, then we can actually just use uh, uh, kind of jetty. And uh, in this case, we're going to call the run jetty and we're going to give it some arguments as well. So this allows us to yeah, use this uh, run jetty function uh, from this ring adapter jetty namespace. Back here, so that's what we've done there. Um, and so, and we've got a main, so we're going to add uh, a main. And this what this one is here is just a very simple way of creating a uh, a jetty application so we're going to run our little web server so it'll be listening to requests on whichever port number we give it and um, it, in this example it's just going to return uh, a simple like, hello world um, message here so i'm just going to grab this so i don't have to type, so you don't have to watch me typing it all in uh, let's see that one there you go yeah be a little bit careful when you're copy pasting into uh closure they get the right brackets in there uh, what did I, what did I do? Uh, so do that boom those dum 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 this code we've just created. Oops. So we're going to uh, we've got a main function now, uh, which is going to is going to do a bit more than what it says there. It's going to take a port number. So this is just the uh, um, the number that it's going to listen to. So for example, um, if we go to the browser again. We're going to uh, access my uh, the application. This application we're going to run. I can type in localhost, and I can give it a number. That number is the port it's listening to. So normally, an application will listen not to um, port eighty. Your web server kind of usually listens to, um, but we can specify whatever port we want to, uh, like eight 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 eight, uh, and we know that it's then just talking specifically to our web server normally you just have a machine a server that's 
that's just acting as a web service. It would just be port 80. But when we're developing, sometimes you want to actually specify a port so you're not clashing with anything else that's running on the, your computer or your server. And if you're running in the cloud, then um, it, the cloud will actually set the port number for you. So you might have to pull that from an environment variable. Shush kitty. Oh, a cat's come to do some closure with me. There we go. Uh, it will work. It won't do a huge amount of stuff, but it will actually work. Hello. And um, let's see. Which kitty? What? You've been fed. <laughs> you just want to be on YouTube, don't you? There you go. Sorry for that, dude. Cat distraction. There we go. Um, oh, yes, there is one interesting thing I should uh, mention in this code, I guess. Um, so if we look at, so we got the body there, uh, which is just a string. So this is just going to return a string, which is it's essentially just a bit of HTML. And um, it's returning a status of 200. And um, it is uh, returning, it's not returning any headers here as well. But the port number, if we're running this on the command line, this port number might be a string or some other format. And because run jetty is really a um, it's a Java application that we uh, we're going to call. We need to make sure we give it the specific uh, type uh, because uh, J uh, Java is a strongly typed uh, static statically uh, typed language. So we need to make sure that we give it the right type, otherwise it might crash or give us an error. So we use this uh, integer function to basically. Transfer, try and uh, make ensure that this port number is um, is a number uh, is a is a proper integer rather than rather than the string, which might uh, cause Jetty to have problems. Um, let's see. Let's go back to our um, terminal. And here, so we're here, let's go and change into the project to do this. Um, and if we, so we added, uh, we added the ring to the project. Uh, we also have got closure in there as well. Uh, did I not save that? I think I saved that by looks of things. So we got ring enclosure in there, and so if we do, uh, if we do, uh, we do line run. It would actually just then pull down um, all the dependencies for us. Uh, we can also do line depths specifically to pull down the dependencies. So this, when we're running our application, this is what it's, it's effectively doing. Uh, I already have. Um, Things installed in my. Uh, if I go to the um, oops, uh, tilde slash dot m two uh, repository. There's a whole bunch of um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that have been included in here, um, like ring uh, in there already. So it doesn't need to download them again. Things are already there. So if you're using Maven or any other kind of like Maven like build tool like Gradle and so on, everything will be already there. So once you download it for one project, they're there for all projects really. So only if you're using a different version that you would need to do when you do line. So if I do line depths again, then it doesn't, it shouldn't need to do anything because it's got all the dependencies. So it only needs to do that once. Um, uh, so if I do line run, um, that should work if I've done it right. Yeah, so it should have started. So it looks like it started uh, Jetty, and it's using Jetty nine, and it's serving on um, it's serving over HTTP on this address. So you can either use zero dot zero dot zero dot zero, or you can use localhost. Um, so I, I guess I'm more used to using. Uh, localhost. So if we go to the browser, 
uh, and open up a thing there, localhost. Uh, eight, eight. Okay, we go. Uh, so, regardless of what kind of uh, web address I go to in there, it's always going to serve me up a uh, the same same content, the same information. Uh, but it, this is an application that's running on the internet. I could publish this on the internet and obviously it'd make me an absolute fortune in my startup. Um, but uh, we want to try and make it do something uh, more interesting and uh, respond to different, uh, different types of requests uh, and different URLs to do different things as well. So let's have a look at that. Um, I'm going to switch back and close that for now just control c to kill it um and uh, then go back to uh here and so we've added jetty to there we can run a very simple server with a very simple just basically returning this function that just generates this basically just generates this map for us uh and this is our response map um so we've had we had a browser it sends in a request to jetty uh it create jetty creates uh also ring creates this request map and um, we've got a function here that's just returning a response map to uh, jetty and that return that and that in that re that returns that back to the browser as as some html uh that the browser is expecting uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to go through that theory. So we've run the web server there. Uh, that's all the same. Again, it, it doesn't matter what port you give it, so long as that's the same port that you go to in your browser. Um, and uh, and then you can see yeah, it's just producing the hello world as it is. And, and there's lots of things you can kind of do with Ring. You can include uh, middleware to be able to do things to the request, uh, but ultimately it'll go to a handler and um, it'll do something. It'll, it'll create, it'll use, like for example, it'll usually create some some HTML to return or some or some data to return. It might return some JSON. If it's an API, then it's going to return some JSON usually, or it might return if it's uh, a closure specific API, it might return some Eden, which is extensible data notation. Uh, and uh, but essentially it's all doing this. And these are all these are all kind of driven and managed by functions in closure. So when we say middleware, it's really just a function and handler, again, it's also just a function and uh, it's it's taking in a map and, and returning a map. Uh, and uh, there's just kind of a um, uh, some context difference between uh, what a request map looks like and what a response map looks like. Uh, no questions so far. That's good. Uh, and so now we're going to create uh, a proper handler function, uh, which is just like a function. Uh, in this case, it's just basically doing pretty much the same thing that we had before. Um, and so let's go back to the source code. And uh, so because Clojure is um, only does a one pass read, so we need to define, we're going to basically replace this function here with a call to a function. So we need to define that function above the main. Uh, so if we do welcome in there, and then we can get rid of this function here. Uh, bloop. Just delete the function. We keep the port reference there, and then we can just do welcome uh, there. So when this application runs, then it, it's still going to uh, call this function, except now it's just an external function as well. So it's not going to actually going to do anything particularly different in this case. It just makes this function a little bit cleaner. And actually, what we're going to do, rather than just calling a specific function here, we can use another library that will help us have um, uh, like a choice. We can put up like a different, like almost like a case statement. We can have different uh, functions called based on on the types of requests that we're actually getting. 
And in order to do that, we use a different library called uh, Composure, which I believe we'll come to in a minute. Yeah, um, I'm going to skip through this. This is quite uh, simple so far. Um, oops, so we've got some theory there as well. Hopefully, you've gone through some of the earlier Catalogia study things, so you can know what's going on there. Oh, um, let's look at middleware. Uh, that's quite useful. So there's lots of middleware, and again, these are kind of just functions. They're going to do something to the request, um, and um, and make sure uh, like the request is in kind of like a format or would like be able to do like development stuff like stack traces and so on to be able to get parameters from there so sometimes you might see um i think yeah, if you go to if you go to youtube for example you get to see um things like this is like parameters let me put that into the uh, uh editor so you can see it um so you might get uh Parameters like that, so you get a question mark, uh, and then so this, so you go to YouTube, it always goes to this watch uh, uh, URL, uh, but then it's adding a parameter to go. So you want to watch a video, but there are like millions of videos on YouTube, so you have to uh, specify the, the video identification. So you put this question mark in there, and you can specify a particular link. So it's a nice, simple way to basically just uh, instead of having like millions of URLs, you just have a, a single URL that basically goes off and finds the right uh, the right video for you in this in this case. And middleware. And so one of the things that's quite useful in um, when we're developing is this wrap reload. And this will allow us to uh, basically uh, have update our application without having to uh, restart it every time. So I'm going to add this to, uh, to our, um, so we've already included ring and because we included the whole thing then we don't need to have another library dependency but we do need to include this ring middleware reload uh in specifically into our namespace so we can then use this wrap reload function so let's go to the top here and And so I'm going to refer, and I'm just going to use this. Uh, I'm going to use this function, but I'm just going to refer it. So I can just use it by, by itself. It's um, we're going to keep this. Uh, this whole namespace is going to be quite kind of ring uh, and composure specific. So in this case, it, it kind of makes sense to just um, use the names directly. Uh, we wouldn't have a wrap reload for anything else but inside the context of Jetty. So it kind of, to me, it makes sense to just use the name. And so rather than calling uh, welcome directly, if we do wrap a reload uh, around the function, uh, then um, everything, every time we change the function, uh, this welcome, then we can uh, we can reload. It will reload the uh, the content. So if we actually change the string of this, we wouldn't need to restart Jetty to get a new uh, to see the new version of this string, and therefore see the new version of the um, uh, uh, message of the HTML that the web page is showing you. Um, I think I do. I need to. Oops, wrong. Uh, and then let's just see. So we do the map wrap reload, uh, and then we just basically because we don't want to evaluate welcome, we actually want to use this uh, reader macro that just says basically treat this as the name. So we want to know the name of the function that we're supposed to be calling, but we don't want to evaluate the function right at this point. We only want to evaluate that function when we actually receive uh, a request. Um, so let's just update that as well. Uh, and you see that we've actually put this into uh, another function called dev main. Um, so let me just change that. Uh, 
So rather than updates, uh, welcome. We have a separate function that we can use uh, when we're actually doing development, because we only really want to use wrap reload when we're developing. It doesn't make sense to have that because we don't really want to uh, people to be able to hack our application and inject new versions of Clojure as the application is running. That's something that we should do via our, our very nicely automated uh, deployment process and, and build process. Uh, okay, just drinking questions. There's no questions. So we've got. Uh, so when we when we run this ourselves, we can run the dev main uh, function rather than the main function, and uh, it will reload the for us. Um, let's see. Uh, and then we can add this to our uh, profiles as well. Um, so let's just dev to our profiles. So I've already got a, an Uber jar profile there, so I don't need the outer profile. Just copy that. Alt tab. Tab. Uh, to the profiles thing above the Uber jar. If I run lining on with the dev profile now, then it'll run uh, the main as to do list core dev main instead of uh, instead of just looking at this main thing here so this this profile will override what it normally does and and if we're just running it as in production then it would just run it would just use this normal main and use the the main function as the entry point and then what else are we doing uh, dun, dun, dun. But this is still only giving us uh, a a fixed function. We could write, we could make the function to do like an if statement or a case statement to do that. But rather that, like for the different kind of requests that we're going to get. Um, but that's a bit clunky. Uh, there's a nice way to do that by using another library called Composure. Uh, and then once we have Composure, I think we've pretty much got everything we need to. So we've got, uh, this is so it's a host working. So we've got our web, uh, we got our web browser sending requests into our adapter, which is our run jetty. Uh, we can optionally put it through middleware. In this case, if it's a dev uh, profile, then we'll go through wrap reload. Uh, and then we've got the request and the request is can be sent to the right handler, so the right function based on something we're going to define with uh, def roots. So def roots is a little macro that's inside Composure that allows us to basically have that case statement, that if statement saying, if it's this type of request, then it goes to this handler uh, and so on and so on. So we can get things like this. We can, uh, we can have a, a def roots function from my app uh, and based on uh, these, so these would be, so if it's a get, just get the root of the thing, then I mean, in this case, it's just returning a string, but this can be a function call to a handler and so on and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just a nice, simple way to define if it's this uh, request, then send it to this function. So we're going to, uh, we're going to do that with our, uh, uh, function as well, and we can do things. We can also get parameters uh, from this as well, um, and uh, we can do all sorts of really nice things in there. So there's quite a lot of examples in here that uh, you can go through uh, that all work. Um, so let's have a look, see what we've done. So we're adding uh, Composure, and I'll update this version to the latest one. If we go and look at, um, if we look at go look at closures, we go and look at Composure. And I think it's something like 1.5 uh, or 1.6. So 1.6.1 is the latest one. Uh, 
let's go and put that into our dependencies. And then we'll also need to um, add this into uh, into our require statement so we can use things like uh, def, def roots to let's close that down. Oops. The dependency, uh, let's go to, uh, yeah, there's a bit of theory about, if you wanted to know about uh, how it all works, I'll leave you up that for you to read later on. Um, and so we're going to add the def roots uh, thing in there and the get. So we're only going to use the get at the moment. We're going to do form. We might do uh, post as well. Um, but to, uh, to make sure we don't include, we're, we only include all the, the specific functions that we want. I'm just going to refer the specific names of the ones we want. Oh, actually, in getting this would be quite useful as well, actually. So if we have a root which uh, doesn't match to any of the ones that we're going to define, then there is a kind of a, a generic not found uh, response that it's going to provide for us as well. So that's a nice way to do that. So let's go and put that into wrap reload into the require statements. There we go. And so now we, uh, so we can see, well, we didn't really need the closure string. This was just an experiment to show you how it works. So we've got ring adapter, we've got the wrap reload, we've got uh, composure core and composure roots. Um, those are the uh, additional namespaces we're pulling in, additional functions we're pulling in. And uh, so rather than calling uh, the handler directly, then we can now have this def roots function. So um, let's see. So we, we're going to add this def roots. I'm going to call it, in this case, we've called it uh, app uh, for application. And then. Uh, and this is going to, so the, the default, uh, well, the uh, most common route, I guess, is going to be just calling localhost 8080, which is this, which is the root of our web application. Uh, and then it's going to call uh, welcome function, which is this one still. And so then, uh, and if, if we do something else, it's going to return this not found um, thing there as well and wrap it into uh, a suitable status message as well. Uh, so instead of welcome here, then we actually change this to app. Oops. Change word. And same for here. So this is not long, no longer welcome. It's app. There we go. And anything else? Uh, I think that's everything we've got. Um, then, uh, yeah, so then we should be able to run that. Uh, let's do and run it here. Let's do everything right. And it's starting. It's started. There we go. So let's go back to here. And I think I've still got that open. There we go. So uh, that was what it looked like. So if we just refresh the page, uh, it looks like that. There we go. But if we go to, so this is the welcome message that we've still got. Uh, and if we go to, oops, I don't want to do that. Uh, if we go to a different URL, let's say programming is awesome. Then we haven't actually defined a route for that, so it's going to give us a different message. So we've got a very simple way to route um, information, a route uh, to different um, to different functions in our application just by defining routes in our def root function. Um, so now we can just keep on adding uh, more and more routes in here. Um, so we could have, we might have a get something like the game. Then we get like score, or, or, 
and then we might have a um, function that uh, is like uh, um, and then we just need to define this just as a normal function that then definitely uh, and this uh, all the all the all the functions that are handlers uh, take a request object. So this is the request map that comes from uh, that comes from ring. Uh, so when um, when a request comes in, then it's generating a request map, uh, and this is gets put through the def roots and um, into the. So all of our functions have to kind of take in a request as an argument. Uh, but they don't have to do anything with it. You see our welcome function actually didn't do anything with the request. Uh, you could actually go in and in, like pull information from the request and do something uh, based on that as well. So you could actually put in some personalization very easily by pulling in kind of information from the request about what's going on. If you do have any parameters as well, you can pull out those parameters and do things with uh, those in, uh, in the... Uh, in the request in the uh, handler function that you've got there as well, um, and so on. Um, let's see, alt tab. Uh, there are quite a few examples of building different routes in here. Um, so if we go back to actually go back to that, so you can uh, so here we are just adding another simple one. So you can actually put in. Like HTML directly in there. That's not very messy. Uh, sorry, that's not very clean. So we'll um, we can we'll show you like a, a way to do that nicer, uh, a nicer way. So you can get um, we can pull out information. What is this one doing? So yeah, so we can pull out information from the request um, ourselves. Uh, so this is basically printing out. Uh, printing out the the request map itself. So what so the request map might be a little bit abstract for you if you haven't done any um, web programming before. And if you actually look at it, it, it is uh, yeah. There's quite a lot of information there that is just kind of low level information about where it's come from. You can see information about like the browser it's been has been used to get this. Um, what like, if it's used gzip and so on for uh, for for compressing the request and response. Um, if there's any cookies being used, which is also useful. Uh, and then things like server name and query strings and so on. So there's quite a lot of information there. It's a bit messy in the, just by printing out the, uh, the map, but there is this uh, ring handler dump, uh, which uh, has this handle dump function, which makes a nice pretty kind of version prettier version of uh, this. And it's kind of this is the basics of yeah of what you would use with Swagger as well. It's like Swagger will kind of do this, but do this for the API that you're actually doing. And just makes it a little bit easier to actually read the contents of uh, the uh, the HTT the HTTP request. And you've got parameters in there as well. So if you do put arguments in there, you can pull those out there. Um, you can see what clients are. So if your if your application only supports certain clients or wants to do different things based on the uh, the browser that's looking at it, so it might have to do different things based on whether the application is uh, whether the browser is Firefox or if it's um, Internet Explorer or if it's Internet Explorer six kind of thing. Um, but this gives you a, a nice way to kind of inspect what kind of requests are coming from the, the browser itself. Uh, and you can do these variable path elements in here as well. So if you want to pull in somebody's name, uh, then you can basically put it into the, uh, the URL uh, as well as a parameter. And you can pull it out. Um, so if I do hello, John, then it will kind of then put my name in there as a... Uh, It'll be able to pull that from the the URL from the request map itself. Um, there's a little example of a, a list calculator I've done here, and so basically it's uh, it's we've we've added this root of 
calculator, uh, and this is using these variable arguments. So we, we're specifying uh, the operation. So like whether it's, is it uh, add, divide, uh, times or minus, uh, and then it's taking in two values. So we can we can add two values together. We can multiply two values together and so on. Um, and so this is basically just using, uh, it's getting the, in the request, uh, it's going to get, uh, it's going to look at root parameters, which is a top level key in the map. And inside that, there's going to be a key called A, uh, and that that's that value is going to be then assigned to A, same for B, and same for the op. Um, and then, uh, Um, oh yeah. Um, oops. Yes. And I defined a uh, a name for operands, uh, which are all the uh, so. In order to actually convert, like uh, the plus and the like the colon plus and my uh, like the string, in of plus into a plus, I'm just using these. Uh, I set up a map so that, like, if the if we supply the plus string, because all the all the values inside the URL are going to be strings, so we need to convert them to the actual uh, symbol names or the actual function names that we're, they represent. So this is what this get operands does. It just looks for uh, plus as a string, uh, and then it'll be returned plus uh, as uh, as the actual function, and then we can just basically calculate the function and return the result. In there as well. Uh, you can deploy stuff to Heroku. I might do. It. I'll do a separate video on doing that as well. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. The only thing you actually need to change to the project. Well, there's a few things you need to make sure that are there, but um, I think it's the it's just this minimum line version you need to add to your project file, and you can also add something called a proc file, which is just basically tells you how to run this on the command line and this is how you would run the application if you're using if you're running it from java uh, and uh, rather than using Linian, which is how you would run this this is how you would run this in production uh, rather than um, rather than that uh, thanks connie um, and then to actually make uh, the to make the web page more interesting and not have to write lots of HTML, you can use something called Hiccup, which we have seen in uh, other videos where we talked, uh, where we where we use reagent, we actually used Hiccup style syntax to be able to kind of define uh, yeah, HTML content, but without having to write HTML cells. Uh, so Hiccup has some functions to define HTML and HTML5 pages, uh, so that HTML would basically convert this vector into uh, yeah into this uh, HTML. So it's a little bit nicer to write this because it, it, this is in a, uh, this is just a normal closure structure, uh, a normal closure deck structure. Uh, and Hiccup is converting that for us. And you can use CSS as well, uh, use CSS uh, like shortcuts uh, and you at CSS um, styles and shortcuts uh, in that way as well. And you can also do programmatic stuff. So here we're just generating an unordered list of, uh, of things in Clojure as well. Um, and, and I'll let you go through this because it's, this is more about uh, if we were going to consume, if we were going to consume an API on the server side as well, how would we kind of make a web page out of that as well? So th this is less less important for us understanding how to build uh, an API. So I'm going to leave that for uh, homework for you because I think what we'll probably do is create um, rather than create uh, a server side app to uh, consume our API, we'll create a client side app. So we'll create a reagent style app to consume our APIs. Um, so like the, for example, if we do the YouTube one, I have, um, uh, I've got, uh, what is it? Um, just the, uh, oops, that's quite uh, big. Um, 
So I've got this website, which I've kind of, it's just a mock front end for the study group. Um, but it's, uh, and it's just a, just a simple website that's using, um, using a bit of bootstrap uh, for the styles and for the, for the layouts of things here. So uh, what I want to do basically is, is basically connect this to the YouTube API. And instead of hard coding all of the, uh, of, uh, all the videos in here, they'd have like a little, uh, they, they, this, this entire kind of, uh, uh, display would be driven by the information that's pulled out of the, uh, YouTube API. So we'll start working on that next week, but hopefully this has given you an idea about how to actually build a server side web application and how that works. And then we'll delve into things like, um, the uh, how to use uh, how to use Swagger and how to use Composure API. So we can look at this in more detail. So we'll create a, a new project based on Composure, Composure API. It will uh, include Swagger, uh, which allows us to um, kind of uh, give us a documentation for our API and also test it as well. And we can do things similar to um, what we've done already, but instead of uh, defining uh, handles, we're defining uh, uh, APIs, which are so we can specify specific APIs. So it's a slightly different syntax, but it's conceptually more or less the same as we've been doing with uh, Ring and um, and Def Roots as well. Uh, so we can basically define a whole bunch of uh, uh, APIs based on, yeah, here we go. So this is an example. So we can define an API. We can define some swagger for it as well, which is again, just a bit of uh, data. It's just uh, uh, some declarative way of expressing our API docs. And then we specify APIs uh, that we can go and uh, get information from. And then we'll also see how this all works inside swagger as well. So if you can't wait till next week, then feel free to have a go at this. I just put this link in the chat and I'll put it into the end of the um, show notes as well. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave it there. I don't think there's anything else to cover. Yes. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, I will see you next week. And we'll go through uh, Composure, API, and Swagger. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>